Um, in the 19th century, Louisa Barnes Pratt, uh, some of you may know her as the wife of missionary Addison Pratt, boarded a train in Salt Lake City for a trip to the east. Other passengers showed interested reactions to her presence, and she remembered that, quote, as soon as it was announced that there were ladies from Utah in the car, a curiosity was at once excited. Some few there were who would shun me. Others were attracted, would draw near, and show a desire to converse. For those who especially wanted to debate the practice of plural marriage with her, Louisa attempted to engage in lively conversation, draw upon scriptural references, and finally bear her testimony. Not the silent, degraded Mormon woman of 19th century stereotypes, Louisa declared, I found it the better way to avoid argument as much as possible, but would testify boldly to what I knew to be true. Later on the same trip, Louisa met a Presbyterian clergyman who, upon learning that Louisa was from Utah, was, quote, very reserved and silent. She remembered, I could see prejudice in his eyes and on his knitted brow. Like she had done before, she attempted to disarm her critic. I took no trouble to draw him into conversation. This story and others like it speak to the pervasive misperceptions and misunderstandings leveled at Mormon women throughout the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. High-profile Mormon women spent much of the 19th century defending themselves to their critics, anti-Mormons, government leaders, first-wave feminists, and women suffrage activists, and from the many Save the Mormon Women societies that proliferated around the country in the latter part of the century. Much like Mormon women today, 19th century foremothers encountered great curiosity, criticism, and of course prejudice for their place as women in a patriarchal religion that openly practiced plural marriage. President Eliza R. Snow at an 1870 indignation meeting in the Salt Lake Tabernacle offered one of the most famous defenses of the status of her sisters, which rings as an appropriate response just as much today as it did in 1870. She said, were we the stupid, degraded, heartbroken beings that we have been represented, silence might better become us. But as women of God, women who stand not as dictators but as counselors to their husbands, and who in the purest, noblest sense of refined womanhood, being truly their helpmates, we not only speak because we have the right, but justice and humanity demand that we should. Today, Mormon women continue to battle the misperceptions and stereotypes attached to them by critics of patriarchal priesthood leadership and traditional gendered spheres that seemingly limit choice. I have attended numerous academic conferences where colleagues have wondered, how can you be a thinking, more thinking woman who accepts Mormonism? And on one occasion, when told that I teach women's history at BYU, one colleague reacted with surprise. Do they allow that? Meaning some kind of Orwellian they, some kind of big brother that doesn't allow teaching of women's history at BYU. Although the official church has discontinued polygamy, outsiders' criticisms of Mormon women have continued to link a culture of polygamy with so-called oppression, particularly in Utah. Following the 2002-2003 Elizabeth Smart kidnapping and rescue, various journalists tried to show exaggerated connections to a culture of male-dominated polygamy that made Elizabeth either unwilling or psychologically unable to attempt escape from her captors. Reflecting poor journalistic integrity, these reporters only cited interviews of women on the fringes of Mormonism, either disaffected Mormon feminists or minority fundamentalist polygamists who are not associated with the official church. As recently as last week, on July 26, 2004, Bill O'Reilly of Fox News linked the Elizabeth Smart kidnapping with Lori Hacking's recent disappearance. And he said, Salt Lake City is getting quite a reputation, women and girls disappearing. It's all very strange. While these sources and reports may feed into readers' desires for anti-Mormon sensationalism, they do not speak to the complete picture of practicing and believing Mormon women's experiences. Negative perceptions of Mormon women have become even more pronounced in recent years, where second-wave feminist awareness has brought greater attention to gender issues in the Church. Especially since the 1970s, divisions have occurred over the passage of the Equal Rights Amendment, female exclusion from priesthood leadership, prayer to Heavenly Mother, and women working outside the home. As other religions have attempted to reform their traditional patriarchies to include female leadership and even ordination, Modern critics question how Mormon women would voluntarily participate in a part patriarchal religion. Much examination of Mormon women's status has viewed the female experience through the lens of victimization and objectification. And for those of us faithful Mormon women, we wish to retake possession of our identity and our image from those who have robbed it from us. Are these misperceptions justified? Well, it is to be true. Since the earliest days of the church, Mormon women have presented a great paradox to outsiders. 
On the one hand, polygamy and patriarchal leadership have depicted women as degraded objects of men's power. On the other hand, Mormon women have had early access to suffrage, healing power, ceremony, religious ceremonies, autonomous leadership in relief society, and access to coeducation when much of the nation still struggled to accept this progressive idea. The contradictions of Mormon women's experiences continue to plague feminists, both, both inside and outside of the church, religious critics and scholars, and some Mormon women themselves. Today's Mormon women attempt to balance their belief in a traditional religion while adapting and responding to the increasing pressure of gendered awareness demanded by a modern world. Perhaps Valerie Hudson has described this dilemma best. She said, despite the plainness of teachings by our prophet and our leaders, practices and beliefs are found in our communities that are sometimes not e easily reconciled with the doctrine that God is no respecter of persons or of gender. Critics of our church see a sham of gender equality and assert that our, religious, our religion discriminates against women. However, believers strongly oppose this criticism, trusting the prophet when he proclaim, proclaims the equality of men and women before God. Yet the unbelievers ask questions that believers may find difficult to answer. How can one re reconcile gender equality in the gospel with the impression that men appear to have more power than women because of their ordination of the priesthood? How can one reconcile the early church practice of polygamy with equal valuation of men and women? And the questions go on. These questions elucidate a significant dualistic problem for women in the church today. One is the constant need to defend ourselves from outsiders' criticisms of women's place in the church. And the second is seeking ways to bring greater gender awareness within the culture, especially where some unrighteous traditions and practices have perpetuated inequality. Regarding this twofold conflict for Mormon women, BYU law professor Cheryl Preston has drawn useful comparisons to women in other what she calls traditional or patriarchal religions, including Islam, Catholicism, Judaism, and Protestant Christianity, who have also felt secular feminist pressure to radically reform or outright reject their religions. Preston has responded, such critics don't speak to the breadth and depth of my experience. Furthermore, secular feminist frameworks are not useful in understanding how women in traditional religions view their own liberation and spiritual gendered equality. Although there may be some individuals who, quote, in the name of religion abuse power, that certainly does not mean that the religion itself or its members generally are sexist, or for that matter, that any thinking woman would recoil from Mormonism. 